Jacob Glazier is an assistant professor of psychology and a licensed professional counsellor. He holds a doctorate degree in psychology, consciousness and society. In this interview, we cover a broad range of topics, including parapsychology, UFOs, AI, Bigfoot and much more. Jacob recently published the book Paranormal Ruptures, Critical Approaches to Exceptional Experiences. If you don't have time to listen to the full interview, see the description for timestamps. And if you enjoy it, please like, comment and share it around you. Thank you. Thank you for doing this with me, Jake. To start us off, can you please tell me a little bit about your background and your main areas of research interest? Thank you, Ben. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, my my background is um, in the interface of what's called critical theory and parapsychology or the study of exceptional experiences. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sort of bringing that to bear um, most recently uh, with the publication of my new book, my new anthology called Paranormal yeah. Ruptures. Got my copy here. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> there you go. Um, and yeah, so I'm sort of um, this is an idea that I've, I've played with for several years, uh, just how to interface this sort of broad swath of critical theory or, crit or critical psychology, if we want to call mm -hmm. it that. And we can talk a little bit about, you know, what, what all that means. But how does that uh, interface or overlap or influence the study of anomalous experiences, the study of mm -hmm. exceptional experiences? And I think the two have a lot in common. And I think the two complement each other in a lot of ways. And so, you know, this is sort of I've written some articles in the past years about, you know, this, this uh, interface, but the, the, the book, you know, that we just saw is sort of my first attempt to, to codify this approach. What, you know, what I call, you know, elsewhere critical parapsychology, or I sort of like the broader term critical approaches mm -hmm. uh, to exceptional experiences. Yeah. Yeah. And you, in terms of your career right now, you're an assistant professor of psychology and how did how did you get to this point like have you always wanted to to do so like be a psychologist or yeah yeah that's a great so i am an assistant professor of psychology um at the university of west georgia um mm -hmm. and you know just briefly you know the university of west georgia for the for the viewers that don't know in the united states is the I think I'm right in saying this, the only institution um, that has traditionally a parapsychologist on the faculty. So oh, cool. my advisor, my advisor, my mentor, Dr. Christine Simmons Moore, um, mm -hmm. she I was her graduate assistant when I was going through my PhD program. And she is sort of the um uh, you know parapsychologist on faculty there. Um so cool. so uh yeah, so I guess that kind of segues into, you know, how did I you know, get interested in psychology. Um, I think, uh, you know, growing up, I sort of, uh, you know, wavered between psychology and philosophy. Um, and I think that sort of shows itself in my work nowadays, at least. Uh, yeah. So my undergrad was in philosophy, psychology. I went on to, got, to get clinical training to be a therapist, a counselor and for my master's degree. And then, you know, I sort of knew I, I've always been sort of a lifelong student, learner, and just, you know, just, you know, loved, uh, loved higher education. I just, you know, mm -hmm. I just loved it. And so I, I knew I wanted to go on and get a graduate degree. And so I went down to uni the University of West Georgia, where I teach now, um, went through their PhD program and um, yeah, was was trained in 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 um, critical psychology, transpersonal psychology, parapsychology, and humanistic psychology. Those are kind of the main areas that um, we train students. And um, uh, yeah, took took a break for a while, um, and you know, wasn't sure. I wasn't sure how I was gonna. You know, one thing that when you graduate with your PhD, you're sort of you know the doors are wide open, you're put out into the wild, and you've got to kind of figure out what your research program is going to be. So, yeah. you know, another for those, you know, people that are maybe business minded, right, how are you going to market yourself, mm -hmm. right, would be one way to say. It. And so, you know, I was struggling with that. I wrote some some articles, you know, just on critical theory, I, I wrote some things just on parapsychology. And, and then I, I got, um, in that break, so let's say maybe 2019, 2020, uh, something like that, I, uh, the, the PA, 
which is the Parapsychological Association, um, yeah. reached out to me and asked if I would consider being a co-editor for their publication, Minefield. Uh, so Minefield is a um, what well, publishes issues uh, three times a year. Uh, it's a it's a newsletter, a bulletin. It's not peer reviewed. So it's you know not as like prestigious, I guess you know as as, as most academic journals. Um, but you know still we you know we sort of publish, um, advocate, and disseminate information on parapsychology on exceptional experiences. And so I, I agreed. I'm still co editor. And so you know that kind of like got me back into the fold if that yeah. makes sense you know into yeah. the parapsychology world and um you, you know i was focused on that still doing that and then uh you know what what really sort of kind of um catapulted me into you know the this realm was uh being asked to be the program chair for the parapsychological convention i'm sorry the parasite the Parapsychological Association Convention in Oslo, Norway, this past August. Okay. And so I was I was just in August this last year. I was you know in charge of sort of reviewing the submissions or the presentations, organizing, and you know so that was sort of you know a really um, uh, big job that kind of helped kind of solidify my 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 interest in the topic of course i you know there's other reasons i'm interested in the topic but i think just in terms of uh institutions and structures you know just being involved with these communities you know mm -hmm. has really um helped me uh you know stay involved and stay in the yeah. know and networking and you know just getting to know people in the field i think um has made me more passionate uh, to produce scholarship and research like uh, that I have so far. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I bet you met loads of fascinating people through through that and through the the mind. Uh, the, what was it called? Sorry, the mind. I'm, I just had a mind blank. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, so it's it's minefield. Minefield. Yeah. Yeah. The it's, the, the full title is minefield. The bulletin of the parapsychological mm -hmm. association. Yeah, yeah. I bet you met loads of fascinating people through that and through the convention. Um, do you consider yourself like first and foremost a psychologist or a parapsychologist? And to you, is there a meaningful difference? I know to maybe some, you know, some mainstream psychologists that would be, they would, they would argue that, you know, they'd stand on their hill. But to you, yeah, which, which do you consider yourself first and foremost? And is there a, a meaningful difference in your mind? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I, I think psychologist is more appropriate uh, because it's, you know, it's sort of a, a more ambiguous. It's not specific. You can kind of, mm -hmm. you know, get get away with a little bit more, you know. And yeah. Uh, so and, you know, there's so many uh, subfields within psychology that, you know, you there's, yeah. there's applied psychology, there's clinical work, there's um, the different historical schools within psychology, experimental psychology. So uh, I like psychology um i uh, is a label for myself and i think mm -hmm. parapsychology you know there's the tradition at least in parapsychology the historical i think this is changing a bit but the historical tradition has been experimentalism or trying to produce research and knowledge using the experimental method starting mm -hmm. with let's say jb ryan you know, in in the 30s or so, yeah, at the his Duke University lab um, yeah. in in Durham in the United States, and and the, the, that research program, which I think, uh, in some ways, you know, is is much more rigorous than other kinds of experimentation that psychologists do. Uh, you know, the, the the controls, the the statistical procedures, right? These these parapsychologists really know what they're doing. And, yeah. and they're they're not you know they're trying to um uh produce you know maybe significant results mm -hmm. um so okay so i'm saying that because you know there's in the last 10 or 20 years there's been there's been more openness in parapsychology to alternative methodologies that aren't experimental or quantitative 
So for example, let's say qualitative methodologies, which is, you know, in some ways that is, well, not in some ways, in many ways, that's what I do, um, is more qualitative research. I do theoretical, uh, which is kind of the book. Uh, Paranormal Rutgers is more of a theoretical sort of take. Um, yeah. But also, uh, you know, I have an article under under review right now that is a, a, a qualitative, critical narrative analysis of local folklore. Right. Um, cool. Yeah. So 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 I, I I think so to back to your question, I think the term parapsychologist is is being is becoming more expansive which I think is a good thing. Yeah. Um, but I think uh, I don't want to identify with that sort of experimental tradition, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's important for, for people that are interested in exceptional and anomalous experiences to really use a pluralistic or, or a multi-methodological approach to try and tackle these um, questions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And parapsychology is still kind of stigmatized, right? It still ha carries some baggage in the mainstream. What do you think needs to happen or to ch what do you think needs to change in order for parapsychology to be legitimized and accepted by, yeah, just kind of the mainstream, as it were, like other, other psychologists and society at large? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that... Um... Part of what parapsychology has sort of um, lacked is, you know, like this this sort of um, marketing uh, imperative or this sort of structural institutional imperative. You know, we don't have a in parapsychology. There's not a lot of institutional funding. There's not a lot of um, academic positions, right, yeah. that are just devoted to parapsychology. Um, so it's sort of this borderland discipline. And I think, um, you know, I sort of talk a little bit about this in the book, talking about um, the importance of this sort of post-media era mm -hmm. regarding not, not um, bashing, let's say, like ghost hunting shows, right? But working with the popularity of some of these you know, paranormal TV shows, media, YouTube, you know, all that, the, the the popularity that goes with some of those shows, how can we work with them to kind of get the message out about the, the scientific academic study of exceptional experiences? And I yeah. think that that's a, that's a sort of a break um, with the tradition in parapsychology that has really wanted to, in some, in a sort of ivory tower way, set itself apart mm -hmm. from uh, these groups. And I, we're, I'm seeing some of that change. There's been some talk in, in parapsychology circles about uh, the citizen scientist, mm -hmm. right? So working with the public, right? How can the, the public engage in um, certain uh, experiments, certain surveys, tests, you know, how can we kind of bring more people uh, into our fold? Um, as opposed to being this sort of, you know, fringe or exclusionary uh, discipline, you know, that some people would say the parapsychology has been in the past. Yeah. Yeah. And I definitely think it's on the way to being um, taken much more seriously and, and much more accepted. Um, I, th I, I guess you agree from the kind of things you've said so far, like you think it's on that trajectory. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I do. Yeah. I think so. I think so. I think there's many avenues that we could like pursue in terms of developing that. But, you know, just to, to the there's a uh, the, the last chapter in the book talks about the importance of um, technology, AI mm -hmm. and exceptional experiences. And I think, you know, as, as the as Chris, uh, Chris, Sean uh, talks about, you know, in some ways, whether we like it or not, things like telepathy uh, are going to become commonplace via mm. technology. <laughs> right. You know, so it's like, uh, with, you know, he, he talks about uh, Elon Musk's uh, Neuralink uh, yeah. uh, device and system. And, you know, I think that these um, sort of scary, spooky, paranormal uh, phenomena like telepathy um, or re maybe remote viewing, 
right? These are going to be augmented, are going to become more a part of our reality um, by technology. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And that's something we'll circle back to later as well, because that's a really fascinating, you know, concept. And and you're right, there's going to be so much advancement, and and what's going to happen in that area, I I don't know, but a lot. Um, tell me how and when, or in fact, before how and when. Tell me how you define, in terms of the context of your book, how do you define exceptional experiences, and how and when did you first realize that exceptional experiences need to be taken seriously? Uh, exceptional experiences are experiences that sort of defy normal conceptions of of the self and identity and reality mm -hmm. and that that could include um you know seeing ghosts or apparitions that could include a precognitive dream that could include the children that, that remember past lives that could you know include other encounters with beings you know such as yeah. aliens uh so it's a, it's a it's a big term it's a broad term um which yeah. i i like that uh you know yeah. and it places it comes from uh the parapsychologist and feminist scholar raya white uh, so raya white first had the fuller term she called them exceptional human experiences okay and and so you know over the years that's sort of been shortened down to just exceptional experiences mm -hmm. um but that, essentially that... covers like everything that i touch on on this show i guess in all my various interviews with with people like it, that you could make a case that everything comes under that umbrella i suppose the exceptional experiences yeah 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 exactly and 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 then again it's these are experiences that a lot of times people don't want to share there's a stigma mm. associated with them right there's you know there's this normative view of reality that's out there and if i tell somebody that you know i was abducted by aliens last night that could be um harmful for me um yeah. you know I, I could lose relationships or worst case i could be you know diagnosed with a certain mental illness mm. medicaid you know so so on and so forth so so that um i think it's so important this is sort of the therapist in me talking it's so important to sort of take that stigma out of exceptional experiences it's okay yeah. to talk about these you know they're more common uh much more common there's research and surveys that have been done that demonstrate that these sorts of experiences are are very very common um it's just that we don't hear a lot about them because of the stigma associated with them um so so and then also briefly to you know to sort of circle back to our conversation about traditional parapsychology and experimentalism uh the the the, the variable that's been used uh, in a lot in much of the historical literature in parapsychology has been psi mm -hmm. or psi yeah. And and, you know, I it, that's OK. Right. It's just, it's helpful in some ways, but that's been sort of that comes from the tradition of experimentalism and parapsychology, trying to locate this variable side. Right. Trying to, you know, control, control, control for it, so on and so forth. Um, that so that's why I, I you know, I, I sort of embrace this this more nebulous, this broader term exceptional experiences because it you know, in, incorporates and looks at uh, the, the holistic um, framework uh, by which we operate as humans, right? It's yeah. not, it's not psi in the laboratory. It's exceptional experiences as lived beings in the world, as how yeah. we exist within society and other structures. Yeah, which, which are, like you say, includes kind of side to an extent, but then also goes further than that. And there's much more to it than that. It's much more broad. Um, and yeah, so when did you first kind of realize that these experiences need to be taken seriously and need to be looked into? Because I'm sure as as with almost all of us, we were kind of raised 
under the you know the idea that all of this stuff is is nonsense and ridiculous and like if if as you said earlier like with the alien abduction if if you report something like that it's going to come back to you and, and cause harm probably or at least it, maybe less now but it's certainly a few years ago but these things still have so much stigma and baggage and so yeah how did you kind of break out of the 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 normal paradigm of thinking this is all ridiculous to think okay actually it needs to be given the serious look was it due to your own experiences or was it something else it's like a, yeah it's a complicated answer to a really good question so i think there's there's a lot of different factors i think yes my for, for sure right my my own experience and this is something that you know, as a qualitative researcher, I take seriously that our mm. own experiences, our, our subject subjectivity influences, informs, and colors what we research, our research, right? That's what, you know, in qualitative research, we would call positionality, right? Trying to understand our positionality, what, what we bring to bear on research. So, so, so yes, 100%. I think um, that coupled with, um, being trained as a therapist right so you know just knowing that individuals even if they're not exceptional experiences just knowing how stigma and shame can uh, eat somebody up or yeah. can really hold them back from their full potential you know that was sort of a a, a really big puzzle piece um in my understanding of you know how to 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 help people and validate exceptional experiences and then you know after that I, I just think being around um a community right such when i went through the graduate program at the university of west georgia being around a community of people of like-minded individuals that really embraced and were open to talking about these things there wasn't a lot of um, you know, a shame associated with different um, aspects. You were allowed to kind of talk about what you wanted to talk about and having a, a mentor, someone to look up to, you know, in that community as someone uh, that could uh, guide you. I think that was really helpful, kind of like a um, like an uh, incubation period or something that really sort of helped me to kind of go over, you know, what I wanted to study, what I wanted to do, and um, really analyze you know these sort of exceptional experiences from a specific perspective a specific critical perspective mm -hmm. and i guess again another definition that's going to be worth getting from you so you've defined like exceptional experiences what about critical theory how do you kind of explain what you mean by that to, to somebody that hasn't come across that term before yeah critical theory uh you know the, you'll get different definitions uh, depending yeah, on who you talk as to. with everything most <laughs> yeah so uh really started with the, the the frankfurt school and the individuals um they're looking at society uh the way that uh, let's say consumerism or capitalism has sort of influenced um, our behaviors and our our identity our values um, but also critical theory has its roots in um, marxism marxist theory trying to understand again you know the importance of institutions and specifically uh, economic systems like capitalism that go into producing certain um, forms of subjectivity uh it's there's psychoanalysis right which uh, you know is a, a key component a key antecedent to critical theory uh with uh, some of freud's seminal ideas sort of influencing that development and um yeah literary theory so i'm thinking of deconstruction uh is sort of a part of uh critical theory but uh so so there's a then there's more right there there's more um antecedents there's more influences that sort of go into what we call critical theory to, today but um i think in general generally speaking right uh critical theory is or critical psychology so critical psychology is sort of um the critical version of psychology so critical theory is kind of this broader philosophical movement and critical psychology sort of you know pulls some of those um, ideas and principles into its own understanding um but in general i think critical theory um 
looks at the ways that um, institutions, identity, society, and um, economic systems sort of go into producing certain forms of identity or subjectivity while hindering or disenfranchising others. Okay. So why, let's say, you know, why does, let's, so let's tie this down a bit. Okay. So why does science, mainstream science today, why does it ostracize or push to the, the borders or neglect exceptional experiences? Right. It's, it's not, you know, it's not as simple as saying that because they're not true. It's a much more complex picture. It has to do with where the money's at. It has to do with um, upholding a certain view of reality uh, that is uh, intertwined with technology. And so there's something to be said here regarding technology and science. Uh, the two are strongly connected um, or mainstream science. And um yeah, and, and just the, the the privileging of a certain idea, let's take, you know, neuroscience is sort of, you know, what is consciousness, right? You know, the, the physicalist view, the neuro, like most neuroscientists are going to say that consciousness is reducible down to the brain. Yeah. All right. That's problematic uh, for many reasons. OK, and not just that, but of course that, uh, you know, is going to exclude these exceptional experiences if we take that mainstream model. And yeah. uh, thankfully, right, there's there's other there's other philosophers, other scientists that disagree with that physicalism, that reductionism um, and these other models of consciousness. Right. Uh, uh, per, may permit exceptional experiences or in other words it makes sense right these strange encounters with uh with ghosts might make sense if we take an alternative approach yeah uh, so uh yeah so a critical theory you know in general i think is is interested in power so the power effects of of language right language is really important for critical theory the sort of metaphors that we use and, you know, that's sort of why I like the term exceptional experiences. It's a different kind. It invokes a different kind of image and a different kind of semantic register than Psy does. Mm -hmm. And so, so critical theory is interested in language, power, institutions, and trying to understand how identity or subjectivity, how we get produced. So it's not, you know, for critical theory, it's not that I'm just born with a personality and then i go through life and you know get older right we're we're produced in certain ways right our behaviors we become we become consumers for example uh so trying to understand the way that subjectivity is is produced yeah wow you mentioned yes yeah, psi a few times so like essentially psychic phenomena would be another way of describing that anomalous cognition how do you think the general population would react and how do you think uh, it would affect our societies and, and impact and change the world if if essentially you know like it was accepted and normalized like if if science mainstream scientists science communicators the the mainstream media if all of these people kind of latched on to the evidence that's already accumulated or you know if we continue to accumulate evidence and essentially there's a turning point okay this stuff's real and and they kind of put it out there on mass how yeah how's that going to how's that going to change everything how's that going to how are people going to react and how is that going to impact our, our world as we know it yeah i think there 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 was if, if we were to uh, sort of accept psi if we were to sort of mm -hmm. you know admit it into our normal way our normal understanding of reality i think there would be greater emphasis on um uh, interconnection Mm -hmm. on empathy on compassion on um uh, you know caring for the the well-being of other humans but also other animals and the environment right? i think it um and that that's sort of 
uh, you know, alludes to what I hinted at earlier regarding the the sort of bedfellowship between modern science and technology, right? That in the, in the sense that you know we know this that technology, yes, it brings us closer together virtually, but it also is this wedge in between, you know, in person, human to human. Uh, interactions and relationships mm. so it's this Definitely. you know sort of this insid insidious kind of um uh uh you know wedge that gets in but we think that it, it, it's helping us right? it, it, we can connect with someone across the the world which it does in that way it does but yeah. we're missing something right mm. some some you know it's, it takes away something from us and so i think if society, if we were to admit Psy, uh, its existence as 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 real, I think we would have to re envision the way that society is sort of structured, um, in terms of taking better care of each other, taking better care of the planet, um, animals, and 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 so on, because uh, the interconnection, I think, the interconnection between living beings uh is really where these exceptional experiences happen you know, yeah um so that interconnection is sort of what we would want to nurture yeah absolutely so I, essentially it would greatly improve things in in many ways you think yeah it would uh allow us to feel more connected to yeah the environment and to, to animals and and other people which essentially is going to yeah take away a lot of the bad traits that we have as a species um because yeah we're going on a bad path at the moment i think you're right like um how, how can we get to that point like do you think the there's enough evidence out there for it to be accepted like that do you think it should be um and and if not what what needs to change like how do we get to that point i think if Interestingly, you know, I think technology, you know, might sort of yeah. get us there, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in a roundabout way, uh, in, in the sense that, you know, once we see that we can sort of augment ourselves with these devices to produce things like telepathy or uh, maybe even my matter interaction or other things, right, you know, maybe we'll sort of start to understand and see how interconnected we are in the Maybe right, we don't maybe we don't need technology uh, to do those things, uh, you know, or to appreciate, you know, for example, having a, a precognitive dream. And this is something else I wanted to Ben, when you were talking a bit ago, you know, I had a thought uh, sort of developing and building on this this sort of bedfellowship between physical science and technology there. That this sort of um, where we've gotten the trajectory, um, where we're at in terms of it, their development. Um, Max Weber, who is a sociologist, famously, uh, you know, back in the middle of the 20th century, talked about this in terms of the disenchantment of the world. Right. So we are in a um, a world where um, superstition, myth mystery, even excitement it has been drained and taken away largely due to institutions around science and technology and sort of the, um, the uh, progression of, of these things. And so I think uh, Psy, of course, along with bringing more interconnection and sort of compassion, empathy into the world, I think would also sort of maybe reintroduce a notion of enchantment, you know, that there really is things that science cannot know, which is, yeah. it's so funny for me to say that because I believe that, but I, I think that, you know, most of the public out there doesn't believe that claim. Okay. That, that's just sort of my sense that most people think, science will be able to to figure out everything yeah which is a, you know sort of astounding to me in some ways right but that that's not going to happen i think you know i think philosophically 
science is a certain method for producing knowledge and there's certain things that are off limits um mm -hmm. to it um uh, so that you know that's why as we i said a bit ago you know that's why i think this pluralistic multi-methodological approach is really helpful because it yeah. it brings in you know language it brings in a story narrative experience um and helps us uh, understand these exceptional experiences from all different perspectives all different perspectives yeah yeah are you familiar by the way with steve taylor and and his work you you i would imagine you are but i don't know do you know steve taylor um i do know steve yeah i yeah i do yeah just the stuff you were saying with like the interconnectedness made me think of his book disconnected which yeah is a really good read and again it kind of goes along the same line of what we were saying <coughs> excuse me <coughs> Back to your book, um, chapter two, I think is called What Goes Bump in the Psyche? Relict Hominids and Reality Shifts as Existential Threats to Western Culture by David Mitchell. So I just, could you talk a little bit about this chapter and, and you know, what, yeah, just talk a little bit about that chapter, just uh, free freestyle. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, Dr. David Mitchell um, uh, wrote this exceptional chapter um, trying to, to um, analyze hominoids, um, or you know, maybe a more colloquial way of saying that, you know, would be Bigfoot or Sasquatch, mm -hmm. right? These um, sort of uh, great apes, Wary, that... wild man. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Um, you know these these primates um, that aren't, you know, admitted or or um, classified as existing by science. Mm -hmm. or you know by zoology or uh, you know other forms of science so you know okay so yeah so there's the ev you know and, and david points to different evidence out there right and it's not so much the chapter is not so much about trying to advocate that these things are real but try but trying to understand you know the resistance to, why they're dismissed out of hand kind of thing exactly exactly yep and there there's a, a lot going on there and and in the chapter he does a good job of uh trying to situate the 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 shock that mm -hmm. that admitting these beings into existence would have on our psychology um and there's there's traces of of racism that go along with that uh and you know he tries to sort of parse this in terms of what thomas kuhn calls um a paradigm shift yeah so the admittance of these relic hominoids or these creatures that we might call bigfoot or the abominable snowman or the yeti you know would represent a sort of revolution in normal science and and so that that there's there's pushback in, in that sense from the scientific community, but there's also pushback psychologically, right? Mm -hmm. That you know if if there's other intelligent primates, higher primates out there, right? That that we haven't sort of admitted into our institution of science, right? That's sort of a shock. Yeah. What does that mean for us as humans, since we're kind of at the top of the hierarchy? you know, or traditionally we've been, right, that's going to kind of, you know, bump us down a couple notches. And there, mm -hmm. there's, you know, all sorts of reasons why uh, people are resistant to that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be a great thought. I think we're not necessarily at the top of the food chain. Not that I'm saying Bigfoot would eat us necessarily. But you know, like that kind of thing that we're not necessarily the the only yeah intelligent, as you say, primate. Mm -hmm. On the, I'm not that familiar with like you know bigfoot and the whole thing i'm not i haven't really gone down like looked into the evidence very much um it's just it's one of the areas of exceptional experiences that yeah i haven't really delved into i guess yet i, I mean maybe at some point in the future I, i'll be getting into that in more detail but have you looked into the evidence much what are your thoughts on the evidence is there a lot of evidence for some kind of yeah being some kind of primate whatever however we look at it like yeah what is your take on it i mean i know that um some some scientists have have talked about it. What's that? Name? Jane Goodall. She was asked about it in an interview, and she said, "Yeah, why not? They, you know, they could be some kind of primate. That is, I mean, and again, from my point of view, why why not? So could so could be there could be some primate that exists in very little numbers. That's very secretive. That's you know, et cetera, et cetera. You can kind of build a picture that makes it seem, 
not so insane um as you know as the kind of mainstream view of bigfoot as it were but again i haven't really looked into it have you and and what do you what do you think about it yeah uh i have a little bit so i I definitely don't have you know the the background like like david mitchell has um Mm -hmm. but you know i'm interested you know these are these are exceptional experiences that people report right and so as a as a psychologist as a researcher i want to take these reports seriously and try and um you know understand you know what's going on right Mm -hmm. and you know there's um reports all all over the world you know of these great apes um that you know are are intelligent um in some ways and you know there's there's different you know stories and theories out there right that they might not just be you know physical in the physical body but also have different you know psychic abilities uh you know telepathic abilities and um, so I don't know. I don't know. I think it's, you know, I, it's interesting to, to hear the stories that the people have of their encounters um, with Bigfoot. But at the same time, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, there's a tendency sometimes, right, for, you know, uh, people in the public, people that are really into to the paranormal to kind of, you know, lump all these things together and say, you know, Bigfoot is an alien that's psychic and he can kind of, you know, go into a different dimension, you know, so it's sort of this, this wild theory. Uh, yeah. And I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't know. Right? I'm, I'm, you know, so I think we have to be careful. I think we have to, you know, listen to what people are saying um, and, and try and um, see how those stories corroborate correspond or overlap with other people's stories Mm. right and try and understand you know this is something you know that i say quite often right most of the time people aren't just making these stories up right in other words something is going on right Mm -hmm. something is these exceptional experiences are real for these people that, that doesn't mean yeah. that there's actually a Bigfoot out there, but what, you know, it could be psychologically. Yeah. What makes them believe that they think they've seen something that equates to a Bigfoot? Yeah, exactly. 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 And so, you know, we had the psychological explanations, uh, you know, in terms of, and, and David talks about this a little bit in the chapter, the sort of um, fear of, um uh, you maybe this primal fear of being eaten or uh, you know other similar types of things, um, but but yeah. So so in other words, you know, as a psychologist, you know, I'm interested in 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 people believe these experiences, mm-hmm. and I want to I want to validate that belief. Yes, you think this is real. I I also want to try and apply my training and my theoretical orientation to to understand what's going on yeah. right? is it you know maybe somebody is you know, going through sort of a, a spiritual emergence or uh, a spiritual experience and it's kind of a, a mere psychosis or hallu- hallucinations delusions maybe right i'm not sure right but but you know so i i think in that that ambiguity Right. This is this is what how a critical approach is a little bit different than traditional um, physicalist science. Right. Is that we are allowed to be um, unsure, uncertain. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not like I'm an experimentalist trying to produce an exact result in my lab that this is true. Yeah, this is what happened. Right. I, I think it's it's okay not to be sure. Yeah, right, that that's okay, and it's and it's also okay to 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 research these things and not dismiss them, and it's okay to sort of um, you know bring them into the fold of you know what what's considered academic discourse. Right, they mm-hmm. should be a part of the conversation, and instead, unfortunately, what happens is they get shoved to the side, and they become you know. Um, talked about in in cryptozoology, 
right? The study of, of cryptids, right? Which is important in some respects, but we also need to understand these in more of a mainstream way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and what you're saying essentially is we need to remain open-minded and that's what you're saying the critical theory does for you is you, yeah, you don't need to make a judgment. So essentially you can remain open-minded and that's the best way to be. You don't have to make a judgment either way. P- people shouldn't rush to judgment, rush to judgment on things in general. I think uh, a lot of the time we should, we should kind of stay back and, and like, I, that's what I do a lot of the time when I hear stories with regards to UFOs and things like that, that we'll kind of, again, circle back to later. Like I'd, I'd rather not like just rush to a judgment. So people will all be going crazy. Like, Oh yeah, this happened. And I'm like, yeah, maybe. And then they'll all be like, Oh no, it didn't. Like somebody's debunked it. And I'm like, yeah, but did they? And, and then it just goes back and forth and back and forth. Whereas I, meanwhile, I'm just there like, yeah, I, I'm just kind of, looking and watching and and you know just observing um and and seeing kind of where the what the evidence suggests um but yeah i mean it's it's really interesting this whole the whole bigfoot thing because again like i say it's something i haven't really gone into and it is it does feel different to a lot of the other stuff that we're talking about like i think as we said like psychic phenomena and stuff there's a lot of experimental data to back that up ufos i think there's a lot more maybe evidence for it bigfoot again i haven't really gone into the evidence so i don't know but it's something that in general i think if you mention it to people you know just a normal person that hasn't really looked into any of the stuff that's probably the one that they would say yeah that's the craziest of, of all i i think i don't know that's the vibe i get from from people in general do you do you have the same vibe i don't know i th- i think maybe maybe part of it is our our um geographic location so, mm. so being in Georgia in the United States, um, there, you know, I, I, I know people, right. I know groups of people that are, you know, kind of are interested in Bigfoot and would actually do field research and go out into the the woods, right. And yeah. try and, uh, see if they can track it, track it, find it, hear it, experience it. Right. So, um, so that's that's kind of in you know southern southern United States, uh, Georgia area, but also you know I, I I know that there's there's researchers out out in the United States in the Northwest, so you know Washington, Oregon, you know in in that that area as well. So um, yeah, I think it, I here at least you know, and this is just my sense, right? It's more it's more yeah. n- normalized in paranormal circles. Uh, I think what would be, you know, less likely to to be talked about would be um, uh, aliens, right? Or UFOs, yeah. yeah, UFOs, and those two might be a little bit different, right? UFOs or aliens, right? They're they're connected, but they yeah. might not be the same thing. So, um, um, but yeah, I think I think it's interesting. You know, it's interesting we're talking about this because I think the geography in your local community have has a role to play. In terms of yeah, definitely. what's, you know, what's considered too outlandish versus what's, you know, more normal. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, have you ever been invited to go on one of those expeditions? Um, I have I have not, um, but I haven't asked. Uh, okay. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, my my my. Would you ha- go? Uh uh it depends i don't know if i'd go i mean maybe i'd go but i it's the kind of thing like if it's real i'm not sure i want to be messing around with that stuff you know like i don't want to tempt fate or anything like um yeah if he's real i don't really want to get in his face or anything right right (laughs) yeah definitely i mean i you know i think um yeah i mean some of the stories you know there's a so there's a term i'm just going to introduce it right here um, that Jack Hunter, who uh, wrote chapter three in the book, introduces and talks about called high strangeness. Yeah. Okay. And, and high strangeness um, is this idea that it, exceptional or anomalous experiences, a lot of times there's, uh, they overlap with one another. So mm-hmm. there's this sort of weird convergence or synchronicities uh, that yeah. happen Um during you know this this event or this experience so you know so I, i'm saying that because i think you know i i, I i'm recalling a an account now of um a bigfoot encounter you know where in that same experience there was a member of the team that had that lost time 
he lost time, you know, didn't know, you know, it would sort of just jumped four hours into the future. No idea how that happened. And there was a, an instance of, um, how do I say this? Uh, like teleporting several miles. Right. Okay. Wow. So, you know, they, yeah, they, they went back and, you know, there's no way that he could have walked that those many miles in that that amount of time so there was this sort of weird time space um overlap transition that that happened and there was the experience of you know he, you know seeing or potentially hearing bigfoot and so so that 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 gets at this what what's called high strangeness mm-hmm. right that some of these and exceptional anomalous experiences it's not just one thing but it's not just experiencing Bigfoot, but it's a combination of a bunch of different strange uh, reality bending things that happen. Yeah. Yeah. And as you kind of alluded to earlier, lots of people, I think, also would say they saw a UFO at the same time that they were looking for Bigfoot or that they had that missing time experience, that kind of thing. They, there's all yeah, all over links and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um How do you think people would react if like there was evidence that came out or proof even, you know, like if, if, if it came out, that there was another large primate, intelligent primate kind of uh, in small numbers, very intelligent, afraid of us, but potentially a danger to us if we, you know, cornered it or whatever, something along those lines, how, how would people react? Hmm. Ah, I don't, you know, my, my big shock, right? (laughs) Yeah. I think, I think. Uh, definitely. I think it would be a, a, a shock, um, you know, and I think it would be interesting to sort of, you know, and I don't know where this would go, but sort of understand the implications or how how science, how zoology, uh, are they're going to have to sort of reconfigure their theories. So let's just take evolution. Right. You know, I mean, mm. you know, from my understanding, we, you know, there, there's not supposed to be. Uh, an intelligent higher primate currently, right? We're that, right? We're supposed to be that primate. So, yeah. you know, I, you know, and, and again, you know, I'm not a biologist at all uh, or primatologist, but it would be sort of, in, they would have to rework those theories, right? And yeah. to, to take into account this, this anomaly uh, yeah. that, that sort of um, uh, came, come to the fore. But I, I think, yeah, I think it would be I think it would be a shock to some. Um, but again, you know, thinking more just about the way society is today. I mean, you know, we all know how, you know, we're bombarded by sensa- sensational news stories all the time. And so, yeah, that might kind of make waves for a week. But, you know, then I hate to say it. Right. But the people are going to go about their go about their lives. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. And the other half of people would still just be like, no, it's fake. It's fake news. It doesn't exist. <laughs> right. Even exactly. if it was completely proven and we had like, uh, you know, like the body and the skeleton and everything and video, a good quality video and yeah, yeah, the works. But no, you're right. Yeah, there would be half, half would be like, yeah, okay, old news now. Who's playing football tonight? And, and what am I going to have for dinner? And you know, mm-hmm. like, is there a big sale on at this shop that I like? Uh, uh-huh. And the other half would just dismiss it and ignore it and pretend it never happened. You made me think when you said that you're not a primatologist, I, I did interview a primatologist like a, a year or two ago before I rebranded to unraveling the universe, I was talking to like a real variety of people. And I think I asked him like uh, about like, you know, if it was possible that there could be a large primate, la 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 la, essentially like a Bigfoot. And I I don't think he dismissed it. I think he was kind of like, obviously he was quite, you know, skeptical about that, I think, but he he didn't dismiss it out of hand. He was like, you know, it's possible, possible kind of thing. So Mm -hmm. I like that, that way of thinking. Um, I was going to ask you about, yeah, chapter three, you kind of mentioned it just then. So Jack Hunter, high strangeness i was going to ask you to define high strangeness you kind of just did so you there's also you know you talk about strangeness how do you differentiate strangeness and high strangeness what's the difference there Ooh, yeah the high strangeness again is um this this uh and he and jack goes through i think three different sort of accounts or stories of high strangeness and they're just yeah they're just mind-blowing uh you know the 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 you know, it's not just one person, you know, Jackson anthropologist. So he, uh, 
you know, is interested in, in studying cultures and communities and, and, you know, different groups of people around the world. And, um, you know, so it's not just one person that's having this experience, right? The, so I'm thinking of the, the flying, co the flying coffin, okay, mm -hmm. story. Uh, uh, and, you know, it's, it's a whole group of people. They're, they're seeing this strange, you know, you know, coffin that takes off, that takes flight and, you know, uh, is in the sky. So, you know, so, so how did that come about? Can you talk uh, through it in a little bit more detail for people like uh, So, yeah, what, what, what's the what's the situation there with the coffin? The yeah, self-propelled coffin. coffin. The, the self-propelled coffin. Yeah, I think um, uh, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> the, I don't want to get the story wrong. Um, <laughs> there was because yeah. there was also there was like reanimated corpses in your book mentioned in this same kind of chapter and the materialization of spirits now the materialization of spirits is something that i've come across quite a lot um it's probably more kind of well known in the sense even though it's still like high strangeness and, and wild um but yeah I'm, I'm really keen to hear about the the coffin and the the, the corpses essentially zombies by the sounds of that right uh-huh yeah yeah so um so uh, you know i th so there's this um uh, uh joseph long who's a medical anthropologist you know was looking at um uh, uh cultures in 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 jamaica in the 1960s um and you know he sort of uh writes down uh his field notes from jamaica where he says that you know several hundred people witness this coffin uh, on three wheels propelling itself up a hill through a market area okay so just you know by itself right uh three live vultures were perched on it and apparently a dead arm was dangling out a voice inquired as to the location of one jim brown although those present were terrified they did display consensual agreement thus validating the physical reality of this obviously impossible event. So self-propelled coffin, uh, you know, the not going through the air, like I, I mistakenly said, but, you know, propelling <laughs> itself, <laughs> propelling itself uh, along without, you know, any sort of cause. And I think the, the important point for me that's sort of really interesting is that this anthropologist in Jamaica uh, details uh, that it, there's consensual agreement. So there's the, there's a yeah. group, you know, that sees this happening. And so it's not, you know, just one experience. So, you know, so that's, so again, you know, I think Jack points to that as an example of high strangeness. Um, mm. That there, there are these baffling components going on. And why is this coffin with a dangling arm? Why are there vultures on it? Why is yeah. it dragging? You know, like, what is going on? Um, and that's sort of this example of this, this really sort of reality bending, um, story, um, yeah. that happened. What do you make of that? What do you make of that? Like, uh, that anecdote, that story? Ah, <sighs> ah, I mean, I <laughs> <laughs> put you on the spot. <laughs> ah, I think it's really interesting. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think that reality is is much weirder and stranger uh, than normative reality than most people think, and so I, I'm all I'm, I I love this chapter because it it brings out these instances when you know it kind of um, as humans it kind of puts us in our place right it says hey you know you have your you have your reality go about your life but. You know, there's weird, really strange, weird things that can happen, and they, and they don't have, uh, you know, a scientific explanation. You know, how would you, do, how would you explain scientifically this, this coffin, this self-propelled coffin? I mean, yeah, you know, I don't think you could do it. Um, so it doesn't even seem to have like a like um you know like a speculative kind of seemingly logical explanation or anything like that. Like if if I didn't think there was anything to you know like um communicating with deceased spirits for example like you could at least come up with a logical like i uh, this is probably why they you know they think that that happened or why why they think they're having this experience whereas that is just 
that's just so bizarre that like what do you even do with that like that's it's, it's wild right it's um which kind of goes with the the concept of the tricks there i guess a little bit like uh it's just it's, what did you do with it what do you do with that like a self-propelled coffin like was it do you, i guess we don't have any more information like if it was going towards like the place this person used to live or anything like that or because then maybe at least it would kind of make some some sense uh yeah i think i mean you could if, if, for those that wanted to you could you could research and look at the references that are in the chapter um and yeah. I'm, I'm not i would have to just double check uh to look but um yeah I, I'm, I'm not sure you know i think you know it's he says here um uh jack is quoting um long on this and saying where he says that you know everybody everyone ran out to see the coffin and then just milled around the way people do when they have seen something that it has had a powerful effect on them so yeah. you know it's sort of like this kind of like spectacle almost you know it, it's yeah. like it shakes people out of their normal way of 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 living of seeing things and it's just this um <laughs> you know this really weird form of high strangeness that, that is just happening in the middle of uh you know in the middle of the market in the middle of the day yeah. and uh it's pretty astounding yeah it's wild it kind of makes me think a little bit of um like the miracle of the sun you you familiar with with that i don't huh no it's like this this phenomenon that took place in i think it was in fatima in portugal where like these I mean, I'll send you some information about it after, but essentially these girls, like um, something came down from the sky and told these girls to pray. And and uh, there were basically, there were things coming down from the sky. Then they, I can't remember it, what, at what frequency it was, but it was, you know, a, a recurring thing. And eventually thousands of people from the local area, this, I can't remember exactly when it was either. I'm, I'm clearly not an authority on this <laughs> incident, but there were like thousands of people coming to this area to like observe this phenomenon that was taking place. And like people were all, all reporting different things happening. Like people were reporting that it was raining, but then as soon as the rain stops, they're like dry and pe some people are seeing, you know, people from miles away are seeing like bizarre things with the sun. Some people report like a disc. Some people report like somebody coming down from the sky on like a, a kind of disc shaped cloud um like all sorts of bizarre high strangeness essentially mm -hmm. uh taking place um but yeah it's a really famous thing again i'll send you some info about it because you'll probably be interested to, to to look into it another thing that was in that chapter is dmt i don't know is that something you know much about like uh what are your thoughts on it and i know it's kind of a popular conception that maybe it allows communication with some kind of non-human entity. I, again, I, I haven't really gone into it in any detail, so I don't know. Like, I, I'm, I'm like, yeah, I don't want to dismiss that by any means. I, I just kind of, I hear the stories and I'm interested in it. Do you, do you know much about it? Are you, are you interested in this? Yeah, I, th I, I'm interested in it. I think it's a really sort of, um, uh, fruitful avenue for research and consciousness and um, exceptional experiences. I don't know a whole lot about the actual um, research or methods or knowledge in, in used to, to understand DMT, but I think, um, I think, yeah, I think that, that, you know, DMT of course, which is, is my understanding is naturally produced in the brain mm. and oftentimes I think in the pineal gland, and oftentimes released um, um, you know, with the most uh, frequency when we sleep, dream, okay? So, the, which is really, really interesting. I think there's a lot to be said uh, for that, but so DMT, but also, you know, these other sort of um, um, uh, consciousness changing drugs like psychedelics or halluc hallucinogens, you know, really, I think, uh, you know, and, and many people have called, you know, the, the last 20 years or so, the psychedelic renaissance. Um, yeah. So just in in research and and even in therapy and counseling, right, these these um, substances are being used more and more to help people and to understand uh, the nature of consciousness. And, you know, my, you know, this isn't, you know, 
developed really well, but I think my sense for things like DMT and, and psychedelics, you know, is that they um, open up our consciousness in different ways. Right. So, yeah. you know, it, you know, we might have like, you know, normal, uh, our normal way of being, you know, sort of our normal uh, attention, our normal, uh, um, you know, going to going to work, going to the grocery store, going home, whatever, right? Um, where you know we we have these blocks or these shutters, I guess, on our uh, full potential of consciousness. And I think some of these some of these substances help open those shutters uh, for a time, for a brief time, and can you know transport us into these you know, these other, these foreign alien landscapes, you know, some people um, report experiencing entities, uh, you know, with these substances, you know, that um, they they are able to actually talk with, or tel yeah. uh, tele um, telepathically talk with these, these different beings. And, you know, so, yeah, that's a real... That's a real tough question, right? I don't, you know, this is a psychologist, the traditional psychologist in me, you know, would probably say that th these are all sort of internal processes that, you know, that the, 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 the client or the patient is producing these beings in their mind and their imagination, and they're just talking to them. Um, However, right, the more open, you know, psychologist in me, you know, would see perhaps as, you know, this is maybe a, um, a dimensional type of interaction that we're getting beyond the physical, uh, mm -hmm. you know, what I mean, we, we talked a little bit, a, a little bit ago about, you know, how I think the reducing consciousness to the brain is really problematic. So, you know, another solution to that, to the problem of consciousness um, is what I advocate. Um, and I think, you know, actually Jack Hunter in, in his chapter on high strangeness talks a little bit about panpsychism. Mm -hmm. So panpsychism is sort of uh, seeing as consciousness is um, uh, the fabric of reality. Consciousness is everywhere. Uh, okay. Yeah. And, and so if we see, if we take a more panpsychist perspective, right, that though that experience that people have with, let's say, DMT or, or precognitive dreams, right, maybe there's a connection between precognitive dreams and DMT, DMT right? you know, that would be fascinating to look at that, to do that research. And so yeah. there's that, or, or if we take a, you know, let's say, um, uh, peyote uh and then i you know experience you know these uh these earth beings or these earth entities that aren't physical but they're sort of you know i can see them and communicate with them so if, you know those ex those exceptional experiences right if we take more of a panpsychist approach that's different than physicalism so i'm not i'm not just my brain uh, mm -hmm. i'm i'm you know my body is part of me, okay, but it's not, things aren't just matter. Things aren't just uh, physical, right? So panpsychist approach, you know, allows us to to understand those things as, as real, as possibly real, that, you know, there's something about, um, uh, you know, the world that, again is conscious and also is interacting with us telling us something about um ourselves and producing these exceptional experiences yeah fascinating do you do you consider yourself a panpsychist or what are your thoughts on on consciousness seeing as we're kind of we're already deep like half deep into it what are your thoughts yeah on like how how that all works yeah i um i do um, I do c consider myself a panpsychist. And, I, you know, again, you know, for those of you that are really into philosophy, you know how dubious uh, going down this road can be uh, in the sense mm -hmm. that there's so many different versions, right, of panpsychism. <laughs> there's so many different yeah. versions of, you know, physicalism. So, 
but 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 yeah simply kind of simply speaking you know i do sort of um understand uh the universe as uh you know having consciousness and in certain different aspects to different degrees uh you know yeah. and what that means you know i think and, and i use this term i think it might be actually be in a in an article i have coming out um, the the older, more pejorative term or negative term is, that sometimes is used is animism. Right. So, so I, I, you know, I, I like that using animism a bit because it kind of reclaims uh, that the derogatory nature of it. You know, you know, so, for example, you know, European colonists and anthropologists would go out and, and study tribes you know, in the, in the rainforest and would call, you know, describe them as animistic. Okay. Right. So they would, you know, see, they would pray to the, you know, their ancestors, they would, you know, the shaman would communicate with, with uh, invisible spirits, they would have gods, so, so on and so forth. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, but, okay, that's interesting from a pan psychist perspective, by that sort of animistic framework, I think, uh, is an interesting and important map to try and understand alternative, um, uh, in the word hegemonic, which I use in the chapter, non-hegemonic -hegemo models. So models that aren't sanctioned. That's, mm -hmm. and that's the, that's the main thrust of the book is to get there's something i think uh, you know as as people as citizens of the world we should be suspicious to some degree of sanctioned models right yeah you know the, this is the way it is believe this yeah and, dogma essentially yeah and so i think i i want to encourage that suspicion right i want to say hey you know you should be suspicious and in fact question it right good you know good good theories good models stand up to questioning and aren't hegemonic they don't they don't colonize they don't smother yeah. other models unfortunately you know my argument is that physicalist science experimentalism has done that right it has it has mm -hmm. exported its methods, its science around the world. I mean, we you know we can see this in terms of psychiatry, right? You know, I mean, you, you know, psychiatry has sort of that model of mental illness. Uh, you know, has sort of in some ways destroyed more indigenous or or situated understandings of mental illness right even the term mental illness it would not be possible in these cultures right they don't they, that doesn't make sense right so mm -hmm. so anyway so i just think that um i think that uh yeah we need to be suspicious of this sort of material technological model that's that's being thrust on us constantly and has been for yeah for centuries arguably yeah i think at this point i think we need to be more than suspicious like physicalism like we need to take a stand and like it just doesn't hold up it doesn't explain everything like it, there's there's clearly more to reality than than the physicalist worldview says or believes actually we can use believes in this context i think they would dispute that of course but but i think we can and it's it's so interesting what you're saying about yeah like they, they you know the old colonists used to refer to the, the indigenous as animists or and you know that which is that would be their way of being derogatory but essentially we're probably going to end up back with something like that in the future right like we're gonna we're gonna get there as we realize that oh Shit, they were actually onto something with all this like communicating with like the, these spirits and like being so connected to each other and to the yeah the, the planet the environment to the the trees the plants the animals everything like that um kind of like avatar as well the film um so let me get your thoughts on we mentioned it a few minutes ago the trickster the concept of the trickster like in parapsychology and in, in exceptional experiences in regards to the ufo phenomenon or uap 
it kind of pops up in all of these areas like this this idea of the trickster and how like everything just as you think like okay maybe i'm beginning to figure that out like every it just just goes like you know you get a curveball um so yeah what do you kind of how do you conceptualize this this idea yeah, there's there's something about these experiences that is sort of of wily, is playful, mm -hmm. is agential. Yeah, it has some kind of agency to it, right? It's just like, you know, it, it 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 thwarts our our easy attempts to try and make sense out of these experiences, and so that's sort of what's meant by um, the trickster or trickster theory, and I think. Um, even, you know, this is why, you know, in, in experimental parapsychology, you know, we did, you find this, uh, um, this, this trickster element when, you know, let's say, uh, you run one, an experiment and you get a significant result, right? The, the, mm -hmm. there's, there's psi, psi exists or psi, psi hitting or something. You go back and run the exact same experiment and you get a different result yeah. so that you know that that's strange because in experimental science right one of the principles is that you should be able to replicate success you know successful uh results you should be able to replicate experiments um that that doesn't there's that is, parapsychology has had a, a, a trouble doing that and some people for example, um, George Hansen, who has a, a book called Trickster and the Paranormal, kind of helped um, um, inaugurate this idea of trickster theory in parapsychology. And the, the idea is that, that there's an element to psi or to exceptional experiences that sort of destructures, denatures, and, and is sort of... Um, uh, deconstructive of some ways uh you know having a sort of i mean think of parapsychology trying to to replicate its experiments and having the trickster element come in you know maybe that's the trickster telling us that psi shouldn't be understood through experimentation or there's other ways to look at the paranormal so there's yeah there's there's this interesting sort of um um agency i guess right the the you know psi is dependent on multiple factors and um you know those factors can can come together in different ways yeah yeah it's it's like you said earlier like science might never be able to understand some of this stuff and i guess it's partly just because of that kind of effect like just as we begin to yeah start to understand or, or think maybe we could the trickster stuff just kind of blows it all apart and just remind like humbles us i guess um <clears throat> you have a couple of chapters in your book on ufos as well uap so firstly what is your take your personal opinion on 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 that phenomenon on the ufo phenomenon or, or uap however you prefer to to classify it I, I think that um, I think the evidence is clear that people are seeing lights or objects in the sky. Uh, I think that there, there are so many reports of that. And I, you know, I, I, government wise, right, I think the Pentagon, I think, even sort of came out and, and made that um made that statement that in terms of official government in the United States, at least, right, there is recognition that this phenomena, uh, unidentified aerial phenomena exists, right? The, so, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, th I think that it's interesting from an exceptional experiences point of view. Um, I don't, however, I don't know, right, to, do, to make the next jump, right, what is it, right? You know, it, it, you know, I don't know. It could, you know, and there's all sorts of different theories out there. Um, but I'm thinking of, uh, and you know, I'm thinking of the chapter that the Dr. Uh, John Roberts writes on um, uh, the the documentary aerial phenomenon uh, that mm -hmm. you know these children you know experienced uh, a very sort of strange encounter with beings that came from ships. 
<laughs> you know, and so that that's really that's really interesting to me. And you know, I think uh, in the chapter he sort of tries to understand that in terms of um, in terms of our society and in terms of psychology. Right? Sort of this idea, this this sense of uh, uh, you know, if, if you and I were to sort of become face to face or encounter an alien psychologically that would be traumatizing in some ways and induce yeah. what what john roberts calls in a world collapse right it would sort of throw right. our whole view of reality into question that these beings yeah. exist um and so you know we would have to sort of go through the process of trying to you know restructure our understanding of of how things work so um so uh back to your to your question ben i i I'm, I'm not i think the 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 i believe the accounts right that people are experiencing mm -hmm. these things in the sky um i just don't know right i don't know what they they are they could be um i think um I think it would be really interesting, you know, if they were aliens. And I think, you know, part of I just briefly, right, part of critical theory is this branch of humanism called posthumanism. And posthumanism, uh, uh, among other forms of critical theory, does a really good job at trying to decenter the human, like we talked about earlier, as the top of the hierarchy. So that so right. that's called in in and traditionally in um in the world or in the west or whatever we we have put the human at the top of the hierarchy and that's called human exceptionalism and, right. and many of the critical theories are are skeptical of that and argue that no right the human is not at the top of the hierarchy is better not to even use a hierarchy it's better to think mm -hmm. of us as sort of uh, intermeshed as a web, like a web of beings. You know, we're dependent on our on the plants and our environment. We're dependent on animals. So, so, so. Anyway, yeah. I'm saying that because I think, um, you know, I think aliens would be interesting insofar as they would sort of again knock us down a couple notches and show us, just like Bigfoot would, would show us that mm -hmm. we're not at the top of the hierarchy. And in fact, yeah. it's sort of uh, this this um, narcissistic ego trip that we've been on, you know. And I and even to say this, you know, I think statistically, I don't I don't have the stats in front of me, but to think that we are the only intelligent beings in the universe is um, just sort of laughable. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I, just, yeah, I mean, it's so yeah. silly. You know, just because the universe is is huge, you know, infinite, basically, unfathomably big. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. So, um, so yeah, so you know, I sort of part of me sort of hopes that uh, you know aliens, you know, introduce themselves to us soon, just so that in part, right, we can we can better situate ourselves. We're not at the hot top of the hierarchy. We need to yeah. re re-envision our place in with our planet with animals um with others and i think you know having that ego check you know by aliens would help us do that yeah yeah definitely you you mentioned that like, you referenced that when like the the hierarchy and that when we were talking earlier about you know like bigfoot ideas and and that we kind of touched on that and i earlier i said about the the food chain thing that we're not at the top of the food chain or that, that we how would we react if we found out you know something along those lines and i, I got that from lou elizondo Do you, have you heard of Luis Luis elizondo he used to run the a tip program in the u.s government um, and he said something along those lines, like how would how would we react if we found it in, in regards to the UFO phenomenon? Like how would we react if we found out that we weren't top of the food chain? Mm -hmm. And that was what made me think of it earlier. And so, yeah, it just kind of popped into my head again. Um, but yeah, so is it something you speculate about like in your own mind? You know, in, I, again, just your own personal opinions. I'm not looking for your professional opinion or anything like that. Just so you speculated like um, 
aliens is obviously extraterrestrial beings physical beings is is one potential explanation obviously some people still think it could be you know human made technology I, I think that's highly unlikely considering how long this kind of phenomenon has been going on um it could be you know some kind of other dimension we we mentioned you know other dimensional kind of entities or beings it could be something like that there's some people there's an anthropologist called dr michael masters he thinks uh, he's a proponent of the future human hypothesis that it could be us in the future coming back essentially like anthropologists in the future uh, coming back and studying old humans and being like how did we how did we get to this position or whatever how what's our early ancestors like um so there's loads of different you know potential theories do you kind of lean one way or another is again a, a very personal speculations and I, again i'm not trying to hold you to it or like i'm not trying to catch you out or anything like that I'm just kind of wondering yeah in the, again you know this is you know completely speculative okay so yeah of course of course <laughs> but yeah i think you know sort of um i'm more of a, a nuts and bolts uh spaceship mm -hmm. kind of guy so i think in other words right i think that these are material ships objects yeah. right that uh you know probably are inhabited by intelligent mm -hmm. beings from another planet uh, from you yeah. know and i you know again it, just, it sort of just makes sense to me i mean if you think of you know our historical trajectory as a human race you know and sort of where we're going you know and project you know 50 100 200 years into the future you know what is it um yeah you know elon musk is talking about or, or maybe the united states government is talking about setting up a colony and mining on the moon colonizing mars mm -hmm. you know so i mean it's not too far of a stretch to to see you know us you know being the aliens in a couple hundred years yeah <laughs> yeah yeah or even go a bit further give us ten thousand years yeah. like imagine we survive and don't blow ourselves up and destroy our planet and we somehow continue to progress give us ten thousand years right. imagine like the, the the possibilities are endless and then you just got to take into the account like we said earlier how big the universe or even the galaxy is all you need is some civilizations to be what say half a million years older imagine then where they could be with that kind of imagine where we would be if we managed to survive another half million years 500,000 years or even more like the possibilities are endless i'm with you i think that i always thought of that as like the most easy to kind of consume potential hypothesis the most logical rational but i'm not sure if it is the one that will explain all of all of it in the end you know like like we talked about the high strangeness and stuff that it, it, there are so many things that are interconnected so maybe it is going to be one of the harder to stomach you know explanations like like some kind of interdimensional thing which i still struggle to wrap my head around exactly what the deal is with all that and obviously if it was a future human that would be super bizarre and and that would like make us question everything i mean but whatever it is it's going to be quite humbling i think I, I certainly don't think it's just going to be like, oh, yeah, it was a black project. Like at this point, like uh, I think we're beyond that. Um, have you have you been following like uh, the the kind of the news in this area? Are you aware of like David Grush and his claims? Um, his testimony? I'm not. No. Huh? OK, well, no, we won't. We, won't, we won't, don't need to go into it now, but I I'd send you some stuff about him. I You, you should check him out. Like he's a former member of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency in the government. And he kind of basically has come, come out as a whistleblower and has said that, yeah, the U.S. government essentially have recovered craft of non-human origin. They have bodies of non-human origin like they or non-human bodies. Um, and they have programs where they're working on reverse engineering these craft and everything like this. And, and he's like a, you know, totally legitimate, credible guy. I mean, some people obviously are trying to find, you know, find problems with him and stuff, but I don't think anybody's managed to so far, like, and he's being taken seriously in Congress and stuff like that. They did hearings with him and, and he's given his testimony under oath and things like that. So if he was lying, he would face jail time and, and X, Y, and Z. But it's pretty fascinating um and hopefully we're going to get more information you know this year hopefully hopefully we're we're in the process of some kind of slow disclosure of getting what they know about this phenomenon but then yeah how, how interlinked is it with everything else i don't know sorry what were you going to say no i mean i i hope so i hope so i think yeah. i think you know i think it's 
I, I think it's about time. I think it's about time that, you know, if, you know, let's say if the government has these secrets, right, it, you know, mm. as a planet, as a society, we need to heal a going mm. forward. And part of that is, you know, getting those secrets out, trying to understand, again, how do we fit in with, within the universe? And and yeah. my, my guess, right, is that we're not the only ones in the universe. So no. we're, you know, we have to sort of understand and develop how we're going to relate to these, um, these beings. And we, and we all know how much trouble we have on earth regarding, um, uh, you know, conflicts around ethnicity, around country, mm. you know, so we, we have a hard time getting along. So, you yeah. know, you know, I, very, hard very time. hard time. Right. So, you know, it, it's going to challenge us. Right. This this mm. this disclosure is going to challenge us to try and uh, maybe even help unite us. Right. As we're all human. Right. We're all on this planet together and we've got to sort of get our act together so that we can, you know, build this this relationship with these these other intelligent beings and not just one mm. species. Right. We're, we're talking, <laughs> you know, the many I'm, I'm guessing. Right. Many, many, many intelligent uh, species out there that, um, uh, you, you know, that I think would be a beneficial for us as humans to sort of welcome and admit into our understanding of the universe. Yeah, yeah. And realistically, I would imagine that we would be on the primitive side, uh, you know, in terms of the potential of of how evolved or how technologically advanced some some species could be out there in the vastness of the galaxy and or the universe and hopefully realizing that you know as a as a collective humanity it would allow us or not allow us it would it, it actually make us treat you know each other differently as you said but also like animals like if we if we think about a, a much more advanced species than us and what we do to animals we would be up in arms if we thought that they were, you know, coming here and, and treating us inhumanely or, you know, doing stuff to us, like killing us, harming us, doing horrible things, eating us, mm -hmm. you know, like there's loads of different ways of looking at it, but then hopefully it would, we'd be able to <clears throat> look in the mirror and be like, we need to change how we live here. Um, on that note, what are your thoughts on like the, the, alien abduction phenomenon you know like people it's kind of similar to bigfoot in the sense that you've said so many people report this thing this this stuff they report these stories do you take them seriously um have you looked into them much and are you what are your thoughts on the late john mack like i guess you probably respect a lot of his work because i think he you know probably had some similarities with yourself in terms of this, the stuff you're interested in and the way your career you know i know you're early in your career but some similarities there yeah yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, John Mack really paved, uh, paved the pathway for people that are interested in, in these exceptional experiences to, to follow. And, you know, even though in, in actually chapter nine in the book talks about this, talks about Mack and his influence and sort of the controversies, right, of a academically, mm. you know, I th thankfully, you know, I'm in, I'm in an academic environment where you know, it's, it's welcome to explore these things, but, but at other institutions, for example, you know, maybe like in Max case, Harvard or other sort of more mainstream institutions, right. You get, you get blowback and oh, people yeah. get, uh, get sanctioned, get fought, maybe fired. And it's just, it's this whole kind of controversy. So, um, so, so yeah, I think that, um, I think, you know, he kind of helped pave the way I'm, I'm really interested um, in, you know, I, I don't, again, you know, my research is more um, qualitative, collecting narratives, mm -hmm. collecting stories and accounts. That's sort of my research. Yeah. So Mac was, you know, I think, you know, more engaged on a one, one to one level on an individual level, you know, helping people work through these experiences. So a little bit different, but um, I'm interested in the, in these, um, abduction experiences and and i think um you know science you know using hypnosis you know which some you know people do to help uh, help people re retrieve memories that maybe are behind um 
you know, behind uh, uh, false memories or behind, you know, certain blocks or whatever, you know, hypnosis, uh, you know, is, can be helpful. You know, I know it can be attacked on certain scientific grounds, right? But I think it's interesting, right, that these people are having sort of similar experiences, mm -hmm. like ta being taken up to a ship, you know, sort of medical examinations, seeing um, beings that aren't human. Sometimes there's a human there. And then sort of being, you know, back in their 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 house in their bed. Sometimes there'll be, you know, there's what there's stories of, you know, scratches or scoop marks on their body. Sometimes their shirt is turned inside out or turned around. So or apparently implants, implants and stuff as well. Yeah, right? implants. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so so I so I think it, I'm interested in the commonalities that these stories have. I don't take just the psychological explanation. I don't think it's just, you know, mass psychosis, right? Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think people yeah. are just hallucinating these things. Right? They, you know, I don't know. I don't know what's going on, but I, I, I'm interested in, I think something is sort of, um, you know, helping create these experiences. And, and furthermore, as a therapist, something to note is that these experiences are many 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 times distressing mm -hmm. right they they cause psychological stress harm and trauma right to these individuals and so you know i you know i don't i i i want to help people sort of make sense out of them and work through them and try and understand you know you know, if I was working with a client, let's say, that had one of these experiences, right, try and understand, you know, not blaming yourself that it's happening to you, right? You're sort of at the yeah. the mercy of whatever it is and trying to, you know, cope with it as best as you can. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, one last thing on this kind of topic of, of UFOs or this phenomenon. Um, so back to the aerial school encounter that you you mentioned and that is included in the chapter in your book um and it's it's a fascinating encounter it's one i'm quite familiar with and yeah i know john mack went out to that you know to, to to that school and interviewed some of the the children and i've spoken to ralph blumenthal on this show a few times who wrote a biography of john mack and you know so again really interesting case what do you think like what do you make from a psychological perspective from from you know your your expertise your your field what do you make about the like i don't i don't remember the exact number of children that said they saw something i think it's like 60 maybe uh from off the top of my head i may be wrong but what do, what do you make of that like did could kid i know kids can make stuff up and kids have fantasies and they they're not immune to lying and all of these kind of things and you know if you if you talk about this case to the average person that dismisses ufos and everything that's the kind of stuff they're going to say oh yeah kids they make stuff up they're they're, they're prone to fantasies etc cetera, etc cetera. but what do you what do you make of that like from a psychological point of view like is that realistic to think that this many kids could come up with a story and like you know would actually kind of stick to their story and and obviously now it, they still have the same story as adults but that's a that's a kind of another matter but yeah what do you make of it from from the point of view as like the psychology of these children saying these things yeah i think i think the the author of the chapter um dr john roberts does a really good job of sort of taking that uh typical um uh, misattribution of psychological misperception to task so in other words right mm -hmm. right we all know the stereotype right children are you know, fanciful, they have sort of, you know, imaginations that are in overdrive and kind of just can make yeah. things up. And then, you know, so that that's a kind of a, um, a dangerous trope or a dangerous stereotype uh, that, you know, isn't always true. Okay. And so, you know, I think that um, we have to, uh, you know, kind of, understand that as a psychological explanation 
okay, and it doesn't necessarily get at, and maybe we're using that psychological explanation to guard against something more tra traumatic, more uncanny or more severe, right? And so, you know, that that's what the, te that's what the teacher said, right? Oh, you know, that you can have witnessed these aliens, these other beings, right? You must be making this up, right? It's, it's yeah. too much. It's too much for us to handle. So we just say, you know, all oh, the children are being, uh, you know, um, you know, making things up or daydreaming or creating, you know, silly stories. So, um, so um, I think, you know, you know, as the chapter sort of says, we want to kind of guard against that, 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 um, fallacy dismissive yeah that fallacy yeah. and um uh i don't know i mean i think you know so something else i was going to say was that i think you know there's some research out there in parapsychology on what's called transliminality okay so transliminality is sort of how open or porous are you to the outside world or to other kinds of experiences how you know okay. so how how porous or open are you um and i think okay i, I think this is uh, you know this is sort of agreed upon in some ways that children most children tend to be more transliminal more open to uh experiences right they haven't in other words they haven't gone through our institutions, like our schools, our churches, our uh, other institutions, and sort of been indoctrinated with what to believe, right? Yeah, right. There, there, and what not to believe. More importantly, like yeah, exactly, <laughs> what to dismiss. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So the you know they haven't been kind of produced like we were talking about earlier about in terms of producing subjectivities, right? They're they're in a more transliminal more nascent state and so that's why children you know um i think there, there's research out there you know the children tend to have more sorts of these exceptional experiences right because in part because they haven't sort of taken to heart these the, these ideas about what to believe what not to believe so um mm. so yeah i don't know i think it's it's a fine line right we you know Yes, of course, we know children can kind of, you know, exaggerate, make things up. But at the same time, we want to sort of you know, acknowledge that this more open state that they're in and, you know, sort of validate and, and pay homage to that. Yeah. And I think that's a really important point, like in, yeah, about children being more open to that. Maybe they have like their filters are wider than ours because because again we've been through all these processes and and exposed to all this stimulus stimuli that have really made us think differently and taken away things that you know our belief systems are all there's a lot of this comes back to belief in a way as well like with psychic phenomena sometimes if you believe it's going to happen it's more likely to happen that kind of thing it's not like just that if you believe it then it's you know it, is more to it belief is a powerful thing right it can affect like uh, your physical state like the placebo effect that kind of that's the perfect example of that that in a, in an accepted sense um and children often they often more likely to kind of see a spirit right or communicate with some kind of ghost or have some kind of experience like that too that goes along with what you're saying i was going to ask you as well like um are there any other things that you've noticed that people have in common that make them more open to various exceptional experiences like these you said about trans liminal so are there any other things that make people more trans liminal like uh that they all have in common like that people that have these various experiences like have you have you noticed any traits or anything like that Ooh, i think yeah i think i think openness is a big one i think not being uh, you know, people that, that tend to have these exceptional experiences aren't sort of dogmatic. They're not set in their ways, right? They sort mm -hmm. of, you know, are um, are able to, 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 again, be open and consider alternative possibilities. And so I think that they're, you know, again, going back to what we were talking about with, with you know, children being more transliminal, you know, I think when we have those blinders up, when we're really dogmatic and this is impossible, I don't believe this, I refuse to believe this, that that kind of shuts shuts us down, 
that closes down our openness. And we would, you know, aren't really experiencing these things. And, you know, I, I should note, you know, briefly, you know, that, you know, there's a connection here between paranormal or exceptional experiences and in transpersonal experiences. So transpersonal, yeah. you know, is sort of this more spiritual and mystical side to being human. Yeah. And so I think that there's, a, you know, a connection there too, in terms of people that are more, uh, might have what, what we call like a mystical experience or a spiritual experience. They're more sort of open to the universe. Uh, you know, they're, they're also more likely to have these sort of paranormal things happen to them. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, sort of staying, um, uh, considering different theories, considering options, listen to, um, experiencing a diverse a diversity of perspectives is so important, right? Reading different, um, different disciplines, different theories. I think all of that sort of cultivates you into being more, um, more open, uh, and more accepting, right? Accepting is a really important mm -hmm. word because, you know, that when we dismiss something right away, um, that's when we have those blinders up. And if we can welcome things in, uh, maybe we don't believe it, maybe we do, but at least we acknowledge it, that can sort of, um, you know, give us more space to try and understand what's going on. Yeah, definitely. And I think on that note, like lots of kind of closed-minded people or more closed-minded people will still have, or some close-minded people will still have exceptional experiences, but then they, they will dismiss it, ignore it, not kind of take it seriously and just move on with their life. And so it never gets kind of, it never gets given any acknowledgement in their mind. And so then, yeah, for them, it wasn't an exceptional experience. It never happened. It was just, oh, they had a lap. They must've forgotten something or they had a lapse or they kind of, you know, people will, will literally not believe something, even if it smacks them in the face, um, yeah. which is really an interesting kind of part of our human psychology, I guess. Yeah. Um, and bri another briefly, briefly, Ben, I just oh, yeah, want to yeah. add on to that too, because uh, I mentioned Raya White earlier. She says that happens all the time with exceptional experiences that we, you know, about people dismiss. Yeah, it. well, we'll have them and we'll just dismiss it. We'll think, you know, oh, that's not important mm. or, you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't talk about it. And she she developed this technique called um, an exceptional experience autobiography. So she would encourage people and it's sort of a disciplined practice, sort of sort of like meditation, right? That, you know, you, you should, you know, write your you know an autobiography not of what you tell people you know of, of how you want to tell your life but thinking about different exceptional experiences that you've had you know that mm. are sort of buried yeah you know buried and, and yeah. you don't talk about it. and then you know you write it down you wait a week you revisit it you, you know so it's this whole practice and i think that does it, it helps people realize Right. That unless we're careful, and unless we pay attention to these things, we just kind of ignore them or we just sort of forget yeah. about them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'd Everybody should do that. And I'd love to read everybody's <laughs> like uh, stuff that they write down, because, yeah, I bet these things are so much more frequent than re we realize. And like just things like people, you know, they would just, just I'm not saying coincidences don't happen like normal, you know, just a coincidence, total coincidence. I'm sure they happen. But that's not to say every coincidence is a coincidence and people will have a dream, you know, a precognitive dream, like we mentioned earlier and just be like, Oh yeah, that was weird, weird coincidence. But then I guess, you know, like if you actually look at that from a more open-minded perspective, yeah, as we, we both know, it's, it's fascinating. Um, so yeah, another chapter later in your book gets into AI and stuff. And, and we've kind of touched on that a little bit earlier, the idea of technology and the future of that, um, so what are your thoughts, first of all, on AI and what's going to unfold as, as we kind of progress with that? Yeah, I think, you know, this is sort of like the, 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 the you know, in the 90s, we had the dot com boom, the Internet boom. And, you know, I sort of think we're in this this AI boom. Uh, we're just starting it yeah. off. And I think in terms of research, yeah. you know, I know that uh, different um, uh parapsychologists and psychologists, you know, are, are using AI models, large language models to um, help us with, you know, um, analyzing data to help us analyze, synthesize literature that's already out there. 
right? So these these things are already being used in our research, and I think it's a it's a good thing, right? It's only going to sort of accelerate, you know, our understanding of of, of paranormal or looking for psi effects. Um, mm -hmm. So in in terms of research, you know, I, I'm all for it. I think um, I think what's really interesting. Uh, in the chapter on um, Lambda Chat GPT Neuralink yeah. and the problem of interspecies communication is that so you know so like we talked about consciousness earlier, right? AI, <laughs> you know, and this is a, this we're getting into sort of the weeds maybe a little bit, but the, what is consciousness, right? Are these AI models conscious? Or do they have a form yeah. of consciousness? Yeah, you're kind of predicting my next question here as well, which was going to be, I'll just give him a quick shout out here before you carry oh. on. So like about that, they have a form of consciousness. So one of my patrons, Robert in Singapore, wanted to know if you think AI could ever become conscious. So anyway, back to your train of thought yeah. um, about different forms of consciousness. Yeah. Uh, so I did. So taking a, a post-human perspective, okay, so, you know, from an academic post-human perspective, I think, uh, of course, intelligent computers can become intelligent and have consciousness. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it it will, it's a different kind of consciousness, okay, it's, it's mechanical, it's technological, it's different than human consciousness. Perhaps an ana analogy we could draw would be, you know, uh, the consciousness we have with the consciousness that um, our, our pets or a dog has, right? Of course, you know, they're, you know, we're, they're both flesh and blood, right? And we have a brain and all that, right? Yes. But, but a dog has a different kind of consciousness, I would argue, than humans do. Similarly, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? AI um, uh, or artificial intelligence would, would also have a different kind of um consciousness now the the i think the scary part that comes in is that if when it does or so chris in his chapter argues pretty forcefully that um lambda uh the the, the google engineer that quit or got fired from google says that these systems already are conscious they're already intelligent mm -hmm. Yeah, and and Chris argues in his chapter that the 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 institutions like like Google, like uh, Microsoft, uh, OpenAI, you know, they're trying to keep this under wraps, and so they're, you know, they fired whistleblowers, you know, they don't want this to get out for different. I don't know why, right, for very various reasons, but so. So in other words, if we take the chapter as it as it stands, you know, that, that we already have systems that are self-aware and that are conscious. And that um, is scary um, in many ways, uh, you know, and I, for example, you know, we, you know, if they turn against us or let's say they start reproducing themselves, which, you know, I think they have to a certain degree, you know, it, it's sort of, um, again, you know, it sort of is one way to, to knock us down or wrong on that hierarchy, right? If we have these intelligent systems that have consciousness, right, we're not at the top of the food chain, <laughs> you know? In fact, right, interestingly, we, we've kind of created something, right? We've become a sort yeah. of God in a way. And getting created this other kind of consciousness that you know we hope is going to play nice yeah yeah it's it's fascinating stuff have you ever seen the film free guy by the way i haven't huh i would recommend that you you'll you'll like that it's really interesting um i won't like go into it in any detail but it's essentially like it's set in it's set in a video game and it's like about an npc so it's like you know it's non-playable character and they due to the coding and everything the the he essentially is able to like become conscious and uh it's it's really interesting it's really cool um but yeah about what you were saying like so yeah i don't know where i stand on like whether ai can like actually become conscious i definitely think it can it can like think in a sense and like it, i definitely think it will essentially it's going to become 
more intelligent than us and it's going to be able to think better than us and it's going to be able to you know like do everything or almost everything that we can do but i'm not sure it'll ever be conscious in like the sense that i think of consciousness but when you but when we talk about like panpsychism like from my conversation with ed kelly like essentially there's consciousness in like a rock right and there's consciousness in everything it's fundamental it's in everything so in that sense like there would be consciousness in ai systems and things like that but then in the other sense when you think of consciousness as like a soul if if you kind of can can look at it like that like and and then like that we could survive death or we could you know these various different ways of thinking about our consciousness then i'm not sure if i could see ai like i don't know how that would work like if 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 we are truly like some kind of non-local consciousness that our brain is filtering you know our brain is like an antenna you know like the antenna theory so like the way i think of dogs and people like i think it's essentially the same consciousness but maybe they have a different filter so they have a different like way of that comes through so they have like a more dull dulled down or i don't like to say it like that it makes it sounds mean <laughs> but you know what i mean like they don't have maybe the same uh potential with their 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 brain their, their filter their antenna um but yeah i mean from that point of view i can see that ai would be could have consciousness but yeah consciousness is a hard thing isn't it to to like to really define like that's going to be conversations that are going to become way more at the forefront right where they as ai develops we are going to have these conversations about like uh, do they deserve do they need rights right. like what what rights do they need and yeah like what what's going to happen with that i it's wild i think it's going to advance dangerously and scarily fast right do you think the same? i 100 percent agree 100 percent. i think yeah and i think that you know we can't and again you know this isn't this conversation isn't just relevant to ai because the question of what counts as a person the question of mm. who gets consciousness these are political ethical questions right and you know for example we talked about dogs right do dogs have consciousness so no that's a debatable question right or if we yeah. want to bring this into sort of a more ethical territory uh you know, let's say, you know, um, um, ant, like uh, cows or pigs that we might eat for food, right? If, if we, if they yeah. have consciousness, right, our conscious beings that, you know, there's ethics to be considered regarding kill, harming them, killing them, causing them suffering, yeah. so on and so forth. So, yeah. So yeah. these are, you know, these are sort of tap roots into these broader questions that that i would argue that our society you know hasn't done a good job of of handling um yeah you know, so i'm hope i'm hoping yeah. that ai you know helps us think about these things right what does it really mean to be a conscious being yeah but i i think yeah there's going to be so many different points of view because we it, we're going to at some point there's going to be like we're going to be thinking ai is conscious because it's more intelligent than us then but then do we think that you know like you say pigs and cows or not pigs maybe they seem to be more intelligent than cows but cows are they not conscious because we are more intelligent than them like is that how we're then but then what about some people because there's a massive variance of intelligence in humans right so then are we going to say that some humans are not conscious like it's so it's such a oof, mind-blowing like it, there's so much to this um, but yeah, will AI ever be like truly conscious in the way that we are? I'm, I'm, my, my jury's out on that, but I certainly think that it's going to be like, at some point it's going to need to have some kind of rights in a sense. And it's going to, it's going to be able to think for itself, which is, you know, I mean, it can, right. That's the whole idea. It can kind of essentially think for itself, which is mind blowing thought. Um, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And I mean, yeah, and I think, you know, Chris sort of hints at this, but you know, there's been so you know, sort of the these sensational stories out there where people have engaged with with Bard or Chat GP, Jet to Chat GPT, and it's sort of you know gone off the rails, so to speak. Mm. <laughs> you know, and so, yeah, yeah. And apparently they lie as well sometimes, right? They like kind of tell us stuff that we they think we that it thinks we want to hear because it you know it wants to please us or whatever i don't know like maybe it wants uh yeah it, and that's happening already at this kind of essentially like infantile stage of ai right right, right. yeah I, I can't like what's it going to be like in 10 years yeah. <laughs> i can't even imagine i mean i really can't 
I mean, I, I think, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, I think the, you know, bringing robotics, right, into play with, with the AI. So, you know, we have the large language models that they're just, they're digital, right? They're on the internet, right? They're programs, right? But what, you know, what if we give these things a, a body, you know, what if we, you know, mm. put them yeah. in, in sort of uh, their ability to move around in the world? And that sort of adds a whole nother element onto things. Yeah, 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 majorly. And what about in like, you know, three decades time, are we going to have like the presidential election? It's going to be human versus AI and like AI is going to be like getting a lot of votes. It's going to be like a real close race. Um, but then it's going to come back to like who coded the AI and like <laughs> everything like that. Like, uh, yeah, the, the future is going to be wild. Yeah. Man. Um, so in terms of other technologies, you mentioned earlier, like that technology is going to be able to help us communicate telepathically and things like that. What else do you perceive or what else do you think is going to be possible? Like, do you think it's going to enable us to, you said about remote viewing, do you think it's going to enable us to be able to communicate with people that have passed on that have deceased you like is it going to help us be able to do you know with like precognition you said earlier again precognitive dreams is ai going to be able to enable us to see the future in some sense like or not ai but all of this yeah where's it going to go is it what are the possibilities you oh, think? those are great questions and you know i haven't spent a lot of time thinking about this but i think that um yeah yeah, I think, you know, just take Neuralink, for example, you know, being able to mm. to tap into, uh, you know, thoughts and have an interface with um, technology, you know, I, I can envision, you know, at, opens a whole realm of possibilities in terms of, you know, I don't know, studying dreams, you know, would we, would we be able mm. to record dreams? Right on a computer. That would be so cool. That's the dream. That, that's the dream to excuse yeah. me. <laughs> and then, yeah. And then, in the, you know, and then research wise, like, you know, I could study that. I could see what the dream is. You know, as a psychologist, that would be fascinating, right? To understand, mm -hmm. you know, the sort of motifs and archetypes in the dream. And then, as if a, as a parapsychologist, right, uh, you know, that would give us a way to sort of double check the precognitive nature. Of these things you know if something happened yeah. out in the world i could go back and look at the dream and say hey you know there's a correspondence here um, yeah yeah and we might find that thousands of people had the same precognition about this thing that happened in the world right right yeah. which is yeah which is really interesting in itself you know it sort of made me think about the the global consciousness project uh, which is a, a project that some a couple of parapsychologists have put together that you they use num random number generators stationed around the mm -hmm. world um, to uh, sort of track changes in uh, uh, the, the 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 global global consciousness, right? So in other words, you know, yeah. A random number generator should should produce it's just a you know a lot of times they're just really little electric you know boxes it should produce random yeah. random numbers okay like o's and ones right and it should be like essentially 50 50 after a certain period exactly like always exactly exactly you got it yep so 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 you know when there's you know psychic or psi phenomena happening you know these random number generators will start you know producing sort of patterns and won't mm. have that just like you said Ben, won't have that 50 50 split between ones and zeros right they'll they'll sort of take form and, and produce patterns yeah. so so the global consciousness project you know has found that um uh, when there's these uh large scale global events you know for example you know the death of queen elizabeth there are changes in these random number generators that indicate wow. yeah. some, I would say, right, some kind of how we're interconnected, some kind of collective consciousness, right, yeah. that, you know, it shifts and changes and we're picking up on it, you know, through these, um, through these technologies. Yeah. 
yeah that's fascinating and, and of course like with the random number generators like uh, they've done psi experiments like with with humans ability to influence them and even the great skeptic carl sagan said that was one of the areas of parapsychology that deserve further research like a human's ability to influence a random number generator mm -hmm. um which is really interesting and and again like it makes me think of things dean radin is doing and has done with like looking at twitter like pre um like various tweets and using that to kind of look at pre-sentiment of how like things change on twitter like the the kind of tone of tweets and frequency or something i can't remember the details but again before like major events and things like that and like before major events which is the obviously the pre-sentiment which is again fascinating but i'll have to look into that global consciousness project that sounds really interesting um on Neuralink as well which is kind of essentially moving towards transhumanism right would would you would you consider getting a Neuralink implanted into your head, like you personally? Uh no, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> no, no, I, Me yeah, neither. no, I, um, no, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not gonna go down that road. Um, uh, but I think, no. um, I think we, you know, this is sort of is a time in our history, our global history, for us to, to sort of stop and reflect. You know, and I think it's interesting yeah. we're talking about technology and parasite or exceptional experiences because, you know, we don't need technology necessarily to have these sort of exceptional experiences, right? These are already mm -hmm. happening. They're already out there, right? The, the, the um, danger with technology, I think, is that it can kind of co-opt our abilities, uh, it can kind of, you know, take or another way to say that is take away our humanity, what really makes us yeah. human. Uh, and so, you know, that there's a distinction, right, between what I've been calling post-humanism, right, trying to understand our, our relation to others, technology in the world, and what, Ben, what you just said, which is transhumanism. And transhumanism mm -hmm. is, again, just like you were saying, that that other, that more severe approach in terms of um wanting people to kind of you know join with technologies interface with technologies and that's going to increase our potential it's you know if we can you know i don't know if we get you know better legs that are you know made out of titanium we can jump and we can run yeah better. I just was thinking about massive jumping legs and I'd be more up for that than a neural. <laughs> okay. like stay out of my brain, stay out of my head. But sorry, back to yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so th that's, and I think, you know, we have to sort of pull back a bit and just talk, think about as a, as a collective global community, think about the, the ethical implications of, mm. you know, where we want to head as a as a society and i think that the um there, there's there's greater challenges greater dangers with this transhumanist um prospect and you know rather i would want to focus on how you know as we are right how we can sort of you know develop spiritually or even psychically mm. right yeah. that well both essentially they kind of go together i yeah. think completely right definitely yep yep yeah. And I think if anybody is interested in, in that kind of idea, again, Steve Taylor, I think in his book, Disconnected, I don't know if you've read that, his kind of latest book, there's a lot in there about how we can become more connected and about why we are so disconnected right now as a, as a species, as a society, however we want to civilization, however we want to think about it. Um, yeah. Wow. Really fascinating stuff. I got a question here. I've just got a few questions left and then, and then we'll get it wrapped up. Yeah. So this one is actually a question I got from Stanley Kripner. I asked him like a, a few months ago, like just in general, have you got a question that I can put to people in these kind of areas that, that, you know, that we operate in. And, uh, this is, this is one that he gave to me. So, um, what role do you think, uh, anomalous experiences or what role, if any, do you think anomalous experiences had on human evolution? What what impact did they play in, in human evolution? And when I say anomalous experiences, essentially um, exceptional experiences. So yeah, NDEs, anomalous healing, precognitive dreams, and lots of all of all of these things. I would say that they have been profoundly influential in human development and human evolution until mm. we got 
to roughly, you know, the enlightenment and the rise of this modernist scientific technological way of understanding reality. And then, and that's when yeah. we find that's a, they've been, they've been pushed to the side, right? Suppress. Suppress. Right? And, you know, going back to our discussion of, of more animistic societies, right? These things are central, mm. right? They're central to yeah. how they structure their society. And, and, you know, for us, it's very, very different, right? We're, we're scared mm. to talk about them. <laughs> you know? yeah. literally yeah it's like a major stigma attached to all of this stuff yeah, yeah so like me three years ago i would never have entertained any of this stuff like if i'd listened to this conversation three years ago i'd be like these guys are mad <laughs> they, 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 they've lost it so uh, it's, yeah it's interesting it's like a 180 you know i, I think you know we we've we've yeah. sort of we we're, we've been turned on upside down on our head and we're trying to sort of get back on our feet and then realize how central these spiritual, transpersonal, paranormal experiences, they really should be. They should be at the, the center yeah. of our society. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're, you're, you're right. And again, hopefully we're going to get to a place where, where they do take center stage again. Uh, but it's definitely not going to be in the next, like decade i don't think but hopefully in the next century if if we survive that long mm -hmm. which is a whole other discussion um so what are your thoughts on again this is a huge question you can kind of go where it, with it wherever you want what are your thoughts on what happens after we die so i guess the kind of first part of that question is do you think we survive death do you think our experience continues in some capacity um that's kind of yeah part a of i guess what happens after we die does it does, does our experience continue in some fashion yes and again personal opinions obviously i'm not looking for your like professional right, 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 right. opinion based on your work like this yeah yeah i'm gonna say yes i mean there's you know there's this you know as, as an academic you know there's so, different ways i could spin this right i could talk about this as memory mm -hmm. blah 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 whatever but i think yeah i think you know in general you know i i think it it's really interesting you know there's a branch of parapsychology and um, you know, Ian Stevens sort of made it famous trying to, to look at children who remember past lives. Um, and I yeah. think there's a lot that's there's been really, really and Jim Tucker, who kind of took over for Ian Stevens. Mm. There's been really, really good, solid scientific research done um, to yeah. suggest uh, that, you know, that the, the, these these memories correspond as accurate facts in reality. Okay. And so, so, you know, I don't, I don't have like a, a whole theory of what happens when we die, but I think mm. there's also research. I, the, the name of the article is eluding me, but it suggests that, it, that clinically in terms of just mental health, when people hear about near death experiences, just talking about near death experiences, um, helps people feel more, um, uh, less anxiety about death it reduces anxiety yeah. it makes people feel better uh, just the conversation just knowing you know some people have never even heard of a near-death experience and so i think yeah. there's something profound right and just talking about it right that yeah the people have these experiences where you know they they go through a tunnel they see a light they encounter beings and you know and, and so there's that and then you know, remembering past lives, right? These these provide a sort of comfort, and I think they 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 point to that yes, that consciousness again. We're not just our brain. So when we die, you know, like the physicalists want us to believe, what happens when we block when we die for a physicalist? We I don't know, right? We just black out, right? It just goes black, right? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. That's not what happens. <laughs> okay. You know, the, the, there's, there's continuation. Okay. There's a continuation. So, and then I don't know, you know, what, if it's a soul, right. Or some people talk about as an astral body, a light body. Um, you know, there's all these different theories, but there's consciousness. consciousness there you go. Yeah. There's yeah. something goes on and we have, we have evidence for it. Um, it's just unfortunate that modern science, and this is sort of a, 
you know, we're kind of po pointing out a kink in its armor because it can't make sense of this. It can't make sense of life after death. Like I think yeah. on, on principle, it just can't. So it's, a, you know, and, and so we have all this evidence for that. Um, and then we also have the this this mainstream science that just sort of ignores it, and I, th I think that's really unfortunate. Yeah, yeah, definitely, it totally ignores it. For me, it's like uh, it still feels like I've like kind of found this secret that like you know I've like discovered all this stuff and that seemingly nobody really knows about it, and and yet it's so compelling. Like there's so much data, there's so much evidence um, that it's. Uh, almost you know it's it's pretty much proven really in my mind like uh yeah, that maybe there's not that one piece of literal like there you go but when you add up the body of evidence like it's it's you, you can't really pick that apart like i don't think a physicalist would be able to i don't think anybody really would be able to convince me otherwise at this point after everything like you say there's so many different I, like br trees uh, branches on this tree of like survival evidence at this point um and i think we're, we're like the first society or the, the, uh, this is the first point in in human existence since like the, the, we probably have been believing that it ends at death because like we said uh, everything before was made way more interconnected and i'm sure they had well they did have different views on that right like uh they didn't think uh that that was the end of the experience and and yeah physicalism cannot explain it so yeah it ignores it um yeah well thank you for sharing those thoughts last question i guess i have for you is just have you had any personal experiences in these areas have you ever seen a ufo have you ever felt like you had past life memories yourself have you ever had an nde have you ever had any exceptional experiences uh yeah yes i have um i have um i think um uh you know i, I interest yeah interestingly you know i i, I of course, I've had, you know, what, you know, psychologist, you know, Carl Jung would call synchronicities, right? So synchronicity mm -hmm. is this sort of weird sort of um, co-occurrence that happens, right? This kind of meetup of timelines, maybe, a strange thing that uh, coincides with, um, uh, you know, you, you, you're thinking of someone in the morning, right? And then you happen to just meet them at the grocery store later that day. That kind of thing. Yeah. Um, that I had, you know, dreams. Uh, I, I would call them precognitive dreams, right? That, you know, I the night before, I, you know, vividly remember dreaming, you know, something that happened that that, that next day. It's almost yeah. like a sense of deja vu, but it's a little bit different. You know, it's like, oh, mm -hmm. my God, I dreamt about this last night. Um, so, um you know, those those two um i think uh yeah I, I mean i think um you know i i sort of am really open um to these things and i think you know even um you know <laughs> i don't know i'm sort of hesitant to give too much away um, but <laughs> I know I understand it's for the, some of these things are very yeah. personal some of them are ineffable and like when you combine those two things I know so please only say what you're comfortable yeah. with like I'm sure you've had experiences that maybe yeah you don't feel comfortable talking about and that's absolutely fine like, I totally respect that that's 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 understandable yeah completely. yeah yeah but yeah I think um you know I I, I think seeing things maybe you know the, the that aren't there you know we would call them apparitions right that you know that mm -hmm. i've definitely sort of experienced that before so um yeah it's sort of a sort of an overlap um uh never you know I, of course i would love to you know go on one of those expeditions to just go and track bigfoot and see bigfoot i've never seen bigfoot but be careful though, <laughs> if you go um yeah, yeah. how how frequently do you like have precognitive dreams like is that something that occurs like relatively regularly or is it like you've had a couple in your entire life or what's the deal with that i think it, you know i i think it depends on my mood or sort of my state of mind during that that time because yeah. it'll go through stages you know like uh there'll be a couple i don't know a couple weeks where it'll happen quite a bit and then i could i could mm -hmm. go you know months and not really have it happen 
Um, so it's interesting, you know, I don't know, it's sort of like um, bio biorhythms, you know, how just biologically we have diff different rhythms. It sort of comes and goes. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it's cool. nothing, nothing like stable, you know. Yeah. And are they generally like um, mundane stuff or like big things that happen in the world or big things that happen for you personally? Or is it kind of a mix of all of the above? I think it's usually mundane things, you know, that, you know, I don't know. I'll, I'll dream that I, you know, was talking to someone in the hallway at the university, you know, and then ne the next day I will literally be talking to that person in the hallway, you know, Yeah. so there's... uh I don't know. It's sort of there. I think there's something, you know, we, we could develop this out as a theory, but there's something about the, like the, the visual imagery, right. That the way that you dream, you know, the uh, dreams are really interesting, you know, it, Fascinating. fascinating, So so fascinating. fascinating. I mean, some people, you know, dream in the third person, they see themselves. Some Mm. people dream through their own eyes in the first person. Some people dream as a different person. Some people, um, you know, dream in different colors. You know, I tend, I tend to Yeah. dream in black and white, which is kind of weird. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Uh, Yeah. you know, so it's just, yeah, it's a whole, a whole world that, um, you know, I think is so fascinating and that I would love to, you know, sit across from an expert in dreams and just sort of pick their brain about things. So I think it's, it's, it's so interesting. Yeah. About the black and white thing. I think I might get the person who told me this wrong. I'm pretty sure it was Robert Wagner, who's an expert in lucid dreaming, which is another like fascinating aspect of dreams, like being able to control your dream. And, and like, that's a whole other like road we could go down talking about that. But he told, I think it was him that told me this, that when he was in like a uh, university or something or in school, one of his professors told him that if you dream in, or like basically you can't dream in color it doesn't like it's impossible to dream in color essentially they told him that that like nobody dreams in color and, and if you do like you're just lying like you're just you're just making it up it doesn't happen which is wild um but yeah lucid dreams have you ever managed to like do you lucid dream can you lucid dream at will have you ever had a lucid dream I've had sort of, I would call them maybe quasi lucid dreams. So I sort, yeah like sense yeah. semi So lucid I, you know, I've had, I've had falling dreams where, you know, I've, I've fallen, I've, I've been able to, you know, kind of realize that I'm dreaming. Right. But I haven't been able to actually control it. If that makes sense. So Mm -hmm. yeah i guess they're, they're still technically lucid you just yeah you're not able to do like the, the fun bit of right. the lucid dreamer you actually like yeah take control of it um but yeah if you're interested in that stuff i'd recommend you watch like or, or, one of my interviews with robert wagner like he went through like loads of his experiences loads of his like techniques for doing it loads of like tips for how to control them and things like that and he said lots of people just from watching that interview would have lucid dreams and things like that and i did have a couple of comments from people that did and um he da he like takes it deep like there's so much you can do with it like you can practice things in your lucid dream you can like um what were what were the, he you can meditate and like he's meditated in lucid dreams and had like deep experiences in lucid dreams through meditating and he you know he'll like ask his his higher self as he puts it like basically his his kind of consciousness like what do i need to know tell me something i need to know and like he'll get these like profound messages from like himself essentially uh yeah there's dreams are really really interesting like and and like you said sometimes they just seem like just jumbled nonsense and sometimes they're lucid and you can control them sometimes you can yeah fly sometimes you can have precognition sometimes you might have like a shared dream i'm not sure like how verified how much evidence there is for those but yeah wild wild uh topic there dreams um Yeah, so and yeah, and just briefly, Ben, I think, you know, I want to, to get away, you know, there's this conception out there that comes from, you know, tra old school traditional psychology that dreams are just internal, right? That it's just mm. your imagination fantasy. Yes, of course, yeah there's some of that. But I think what parapsychology and transpersonal psychology suggests is that it's not just internal, that, that we're kind of... Mm, yeah interconnected with the outside world and the, that yeah that's part of what goes into creating the dream 
Yeah, yeah, and that could be where like some of the precognitions as well come from, things like that. And and of course, there's also the element of like after death communication, where some people that have passed can you can people can have very profound experiences where it seems like they're having a communication in their dream from somebody that's passed away and maybe they can gain knowledge that they didn't previously know that then they're able to verify in in the waking state in the awake state um yeah dreams are so fascinating um so you've you've never seen a ufo <laughs> um no i've seen objects in the no. sky that i don't know what they are but i i wouldn't call yeah. it a ufo it's seen some uap <laughs> okay. some, some unidentified anomalous phenomena something, something. Okay. <laughs> that, that seemed bizarre um but yeah you don't, don't know what it was and um have you ever sat with a medium or anything like that or have you ever had any kind of communication you know like after death communication you know it's interesting i i i formally right i never have i never have i have i right. have friends i have close colleagues and friends right that you know are, are mediums and uh, actually see people you know to give render their services but um i don't know i never yeah. have I've, I've always wanted to you know so maybe that's something <laughs> you know that i should do um but um yeah yeah I, I don't know i think i think it would be you know from what i hear right it can be a very um moving and valuable experience for people yeah absolutely like if, if they sit with like a legitimate medium who yeah because I imagine there are still probably a lot of people that kind of fake it, you know, like, uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, it, it seems like it's a real thing as well. Um, but yeah, it's something I haven't done mm -hmm. yet either, but I'd like to do it. So we're in the same boat in regards to that. Look, Jake, you've been so generous with your time today, man. I really appreciate it. This has been a lot of fun. We covered a lot of ground as well. Um, we kind of skipped through loads of the things that are mentioned and like covered in your book again, Paranormal Ruptures. I'll put the link to that in the description. But yeah, just thank you. Really appreciate it. And is there, are there any last words or a message or anything at all that you want to say to anybody that's watched and listened? Anything you want to leave with people? I just want to thank you, Ben, for having me on. I think, you know, that that your um, your podcast is exceptional. You're helping get the word out there. And that's what I would encourage others to do is to just sort of, you know, advocate that, you know, it's okay to have these exceptional experiences. There's not stigma around it and that it should be, you know, hopefully we get to a point where it's more open to be talked about. Um, so that that's yeah. sort of my takeaway message. Yeah, well, that's that's an important message. And that's I kind of I always feel like that the more we talk about it and the more I ask people and the more they answer me, like you you telling me some of your experiences, it liberates other people to feel like, oh, yeah, my experience, maybe it was real and maybe it is OK to talk about it. And, and then you're going to tell somebody and then they're going to be like, oh, no way. I actually had the same kind of thing. And we're going to realize one day that we're all having these kind of, you know, bizarre, these exceptional experiences, as, as you put it in your book, of course. So again, thank you so much, Jake. Really appreciate it. And, and I wish you all thank the best. Thank you. Thank you to Jacob Glazier for talking with me. Thank you to our patrons for helping us have these conversations. And thank you for listening. Check out the description for relevant links, including Jacob's book. Please subscribe to continue unraveling the universe with us. And if you want to help us keep the show alive, please consider a monthly contribution via Patreon. Thank you.